They just wanted to know who was cooperating with me, who was working with me. Telling them was not an option. Simple as like that. I prefer to die. Majid Shafei grew up in a prominent Muslim family in Egypt. But even at a young age, he struggled with Islamic beliefs and practices. There was a lot of violence. There was no place for forgiveness. There was no sacrifice. There was no woman rights. There was no minority rights. He was also troubled by the persecution of people in other religions, especially when he started making Christian friends in college. I saw how peaceful they are. I saw how forgiving they are. I saw the principles and the values that they have. So I didn't understand why you want to persecute people that they are that peaceful. And I needed to know what truth that these Christians have that I was not even allowed to hear. To get answers, Majid went to his Christian friend, Tamar, who in turn gave him a Bible. And the more that I read, the more that I saw this amazing Lord that came on earth to die for us, for our pain and sins and disease. And I saw all of his sacrifice, all his love. That's when I came to the conclusion, that's when I came to the revolution that that's the God that we should worship. That's the God that I want to follow. Majid committed his life to Jesus Christ. This feeling of freedom, this feeling of liberation, there is nothing like when you know that you are a child of God and you are not a slave. Shortly after, Majid and Tamar formed an underground organization. They used caves to hide their church services and other activities. We built one Bible school, one medical clinic, and we established you know, a newspaper asking from the Egyptian government to give us our rights. The government responded by targeting the organization. One day, Egyptian soldiers discovered one of their caves and opened fire. Majid and Tamar were there. One of the Egyptian officers aimed at me. I didn't see Tamer dead. So the officer shot, and that's when Tamer pushed me on the ground, and he took a bullet, and he died for me. And his last word for me was, uh, continue the fight, never give up. Majid escaped and continued his work. Three months later, Egyptian police forced their way into his home and arrested him. An officer came and he said, I need to know everything about you, who you are, who working with you. I told him, I don't know anything. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what organization. And he told me, you want to play tough? We can play tough together. I told him, tough is my middle name. You don't need to worry about that. Next day, they transferred me to Abu Zab al prison. For the locals, Abu Zabal prison is called hell on earth. Trying to get information, interrogators began systematically torturing Majid. You're underground, you're bleeding from everywhere. You're beaten, there is no even a window in your cell. It's underground, is absolute darkness. Absolute darkness. And the only thing that you can hear is the scream of the other people with you in the other cells. I really thought I, will, I, I would die there. Very few people came out with a life, very few people. After two days, Majid feared he would betray his friends. Lying down in a pool of my own blood, that was my prayer. I told him, Lord, I want to thank you for your gift on the cross. I don't regret believing in you. You died for me and I will live and I will die for you. However, Lord, you made me out of flesh and blood. You know how weak I am. And my only request to you is to kill me before tomorrow morning. The next day, his captors brought in dogs. Majid braced himself for the attack. There was absolute quiet and calm. So I removed my hand away from my face, just little by little. And that's what I saw. By God, all three dogs sitting around me, none of them moved one single step. The another three dogs came sit in the same position with one little different. The middle one took a step forward and he licked my face. I got the same message that the officers got, that maybe I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. Somebody else here with me. His interrogator returned the following day. This time, he made him an offer. He said, you tell me the name of your friends. 
I will release you. I will make you witness in the case. I will release you. He listed everything that any man will desire. I looked at him. I told him, oh, that's, that's a very good deal. I, I will take it. Go get me food and water, and after that, we'll talk together. He said, whatever you like, I will bring it to you. I told him, shish kebab. He went, he bring an Egyptian food. I sat down, I ate. He told me, now you tell me the name of your friends. I told him, listen, we're a big group. Thousands of us. I will not remember all of us, but I can give you the name of our leader. He told me, okay, give me the name of your leader. I told him the name of our leader, Jesus Christ. If you can catch him, catch him. Retaliation was severe. Majid remembers enduring two more days of torture before losing consciousness and later waking up in a hospital. It took him months to recover, only to face charges of treason in Egypt's military court. And I will tell you what I told the judge in this day. If loving Christ and if worshiping him is a crime, I'm guilty as charge, Your Honor. They give me the death penalty. Placed under house arrest, Majid waited for his execution. He was unaware that his organization had planned a rescue. They came uh, with arms. They was able to attack the Egyptian soldiers. They just grabbed me. And that's when we put, put everything in the car, crossed to Alexandria. Uh, during this time, the Egyptian police put my pictures in every newspaper, in every magazine, uh, every TV shows. That's when my friends told me, you have to leave the country. You cannot stay any longer. To avoid capture, he made his way east to the port city of Taba. There, he took a jet ski and navigated his way past border patrol boats to make it safely to Israel. And I surrendered to the Israeli police. And through Amnesty International and United Nations, I was accepted as a landed political refugee. Eventually, Majid made his way to Canada, where today he leads One Free World International a human rights organization committed to helping persecuted people worldwide. He's my Lord and my Savior, my best friend. And he walks with me wherever I go. He just walks with me. Once you know that you found him, there is nothing else matter after that. Nothing else. This is a rare view that few outsiders witness, a secret meeting of Iranian Christians in a neighboring country not far from the border. These brand new followers of Christ receive Bible teaching and participate in their very first communion. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. After a few songs and prayers, several are baptized. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Then it's back for more late night Bible study and training before returning to Iran. For the first time, these Christians learn how to look up and memorize scripture. They're Kurds, former Muslims who converted to Christianity. If their identities and this location is revealed to secret police, Iranian agents would come and arrest them. Some may even be killed for being apostates. This former Muslim we will call Daoud knows the dangers all too well. Before he became a Christian, Iranian police caught him eating a sandwich instead of fasting during the Islamic holy month of Ramadan. That violated Sharia law, and a judge ordered him to receive 70 lashes, punishment similar to that imposed by the Taliban. I was tied down. A mullah held the Quran in his hand and recited a verse, and then a soldier beat my back with a cable. It made me feel deep hatred against Islamic Republic of Iran. All I did was grab a sandwich and eat it. Why is that a sin? Later, Daoud met some Christians on the internet who introduced him to Christ. He embraced Christianity after witnessing miracles of healing and deliverance. Daoud keeps his newfound faith secret while quietly and cautiously sharing Christ with others in his city. Right now, it is really scary because if the government knows about it, I'm pretty sure they will execute me. Another former Muslim turned Christian, Reza, says he shares his faith because he wants Iranians to live in the light. While President Rouhani promises societal reforms, Reza says an aggressive government crackdown against Christians continues. Iranian agents come and arrest us, saying that we are spies for Western countries. They say, because of that, you are a traitor to your country and should be executed. 
In fact, few of the 40 or so known Christians imprisoned in Iran have been charged as apostates or for spreading the gospel. The official charge is usually espionage or undermining national security. That's the charge against Iranian-American pastor Saeed Abedini, still serving an eight-year prison sentence. Saeed is well known because he's an American and uh, we certainly need to pray for him and his situation and his family. But there are many others, like Farshid. Security police arrested 35-year-old Iranian Christian Farshid Fatih during a Christmas raid against house churches in 2010. He is serving six years in Iran's infamous Evan prison. David Yegnazar of Elam Ministries says a prison guard recently broke Farshid's foot during a mass inmate assault. The foot went untreated for three days. But Farshid wrote a very beautiful letter uh, saying that it was an incredible moment for him because he was in this pain uh, over the Easter weekend and it gave him a very different view of the whole Easter story. And finally having some relief on the Sunday morning was great. He went on to say, we forgive them for all they have done because we are followers of the one who says, Father, please forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Yegnazar says the Iranian church continues to grow in Iran despite or perhaps because of the inhumane treatment of prisoners like Farshid and Saeed. Their courage means that the church continues to grow. So it's really, although it's a story of suffering, there's also a story of growth in the church in Iran. Iran has one of the fastest growing Christian populations in the world. Evangelist Reza says more and more Iranians tell him they've grown tired of the oppressive policies of the Ayatollahs. People feel a hunger and a thirst to know the truth. When I talk to them about Christ and tell them how God loves us, they become so excited and they just keep smiling. So what role can the U.S. government play to help protect Reza and other Christians inside Iran? It would be important for politicians all around the world to put the pressure on Iran, not for just for Christian freedom, but for the freedom of many inside the country. Evangelist Reza asks for prayer. Pray that God will give us strength and power in our faith, because Christian faith in Iran is not easy. It is difficult, dangerous, and risky. And pray for salvation to come, that all Iranians will be saved. With Iranian followers of Christ in the Middle East, Gary Lane, CBN News.